What's going on? My name is Brayden. I'm a Catan board game kind of a fanatic. And guess what? I just read these rules and these rules about a bajillion times. And I want to show you how to play Game of Thrones Catan, Brotherhood of the Watch. Let's get to it. So yes, I have set up my board on the carpet. Don't judge me. This is just how it's going to be. I am going to make sure that you know by the end of this video how to play this game. Let's start with, though, the differences between Game of Thrones Catan and the base game. Difference number one, you've got the wildlings. They are coming into Catan up here in this area, trying to breach the wall to come into what the game's calling the gift. Those are a new part of the game. That is what you got to stop from ruining your experience. Then you've got these nifty guards. Remember Jon Snow? Yep, you got Jon Snow sitting right there on the wall trying to prevent these wildlings from breaching that wall. These guys are gonna stop those guys. Then you got your heroes. I'll explain these, but basically your hero is your special ability for your turn. You get to take a hero during your turn, use the ability, and then flip it over to use it again, or return it to the pile and choose a new hero for your next turn. Really fun part of the game that adds some versatility to the gameplay and also helps you get those guys out of the way. Now, it's not a completely new part of the game, but the development cards over here, these guys, believe it or not, are super helpful. These have become a much more important part of the game, in my opinion, than the base game. And I highly recommend that you start buying these and using these throughout the game. They are a lifesaver, especially this Range Patrol. Because guess what? This is the new Knight card, or as if you're really old playing the game, the new Soldier card that lets you not only move the robber, you can also, if you want, guess what? Remove those guys from the game and get them out of here. Then you got some victory point changes, okay? The first one's kind of obvious. You still have the longest road, and you have the largest patrol, as seen by these two cards. This largest patrol is basically the same thing as largest army. But do you read it? One victory point. One victory point. And why do you think they reduced the victory points for these? They're so nice because of the guards. If you have five guards on a wall, I'm talking about five guards standing up here, you have two victory points automatically. If whenever you go down to less than five guards, you remove one of those victory points. If you have three guards on there, you have one victory point. If ever you go less than three guards, you're down to just zero victory points. Okay, so just so you know, guards give you victory points as well, and they do help to win the game. The game, though, is still played to 10 victory points. That stays the same. Another fun new change for the Brotherhood of the Watch game is you can trade with the bank at a 3 to 1 rate. 3 of one resource for 1 of another. That is going to be super convenient as well. You no longer need 4 of one resource, you only need 3. And lastly, do you remember your friendly robber? You have Tormund now, the redhead dude, that now lurks around Catan, or in the gift, and helps to eliminate resources from a player's hand. And an honorable mention, not that it's a huge deal, but obviously on your building cost card, you'll notice that a city is no longer a city. It is called a keep, but a settlement is still called a settlement. So I'm going to make it my mission in this video to make sure you know the rules, because I'm a really big rule keeper. Okay, I don't like to break rules. So I'm going to make sure you know the rules as well as possible. Please feel free to ask questions in the comments if you don't understand something. Happy to explain it to you. So A, I want you to know the rules. And B, I want you to know how you can enjoy playing this game. I know that you're most likely here because you want to learn about the wildlings. Skip to that part of the video and just watch the wildling part if you want to. But I'm going to go through the setup, the, a little bit of the gameplay, and then finally explain the wildlings in full detail. But you can see the chapter down below and you can explain it. But the reason I like this game, I like this game better than the base game of Catan. It's one of my favorite parts of Catan because of the simplicity of it. It's still basically as simple as the base game. You still got to build your cities, build, sorry, build your keeps and build your settlements to get the 10 victory points. But it's nice to have that ongoing co-op aspect of the game of defending the gift from the wildlings. Um, you'll notice that there's even a way to have a tragic victory in this game. You can loot, you can end the game by basically having the wildlings take over and there is still a victor out of that. So I kind of enjoy that versatility of the game, being able to use those heroes. It reminds me of Cities and Knights to a certain extent, to a certain extent, but it's not nearly as complicated as Cities and Knights, which if I was to choose as of right now, Cities and Knights is my favorite. But uh, I'm going to go through this now and hopefully you enjoy the video.
All right, let's talk about the uh, general setup of this game, okay? So the way I've set this up is if you're looking at the rule book, I've set it up exactly as the rule book explains how to set it up. It's on the back of the smaller rule book, as you see the four-player setup there. There's also a setup for a three-player setup as well. Uh, just I just follow that. Now, of course, you can change all the hexes. You can, of course, rotate how you want these harbors to be set up. Yes, you can even change the numbers. All of that is totally legal. My point of showing you why they encourage you to start like this is because not only do they spread the resources around evenly, but if you notice, the higher numbers are at the top, and then the numbers get lower as you get towards the bottom. The reason it's th like that in this game is because when the wildlings jump over the wall, they actually start to block numbers. Guess which ones they block first? The higher ones. So there's a part of this game where the reason it's set up this way is because, yeah, you, you can put your settlement or your keep up here at the top of the the gift, but you risk obviously getting blocked by the wildlings, which will then hurt your production, etc. So just be aware of that. But if you're like me, a fanatic of the game, I know that you're eventually going to just mix all this up, mix up all the numbers, mix up all the hexes just to see how it goes, which is fun as well. But I do encourage you to keep the harbors here. The, the rule book actually encourages you to, to do that as well. You can rotate you know, the order of the harbors, but make sure they look like this. It's nice to have the, I call them harbors, but in the game they're called trade routes. But it's just nice to be able to access them at the, at the bottom of the map. Uh, I think it's just better for the overall flow of the setup because it's just the most natural spot for a fair way to access the trade routes for everybody. Now, I know I only have one color on the board right now. I'm just using this as an example. Just know that just like the base game, when you're setting up the game, you still have the first player put their settlement down all the way to the third. Then the third player put their second settlement down all the way back to the first. Okay, so all that stays the same. The part of the setup phase that changes is that once you're done placing your settlements and your roads on that setup phase, guess what you also do? The first player puts their guard down, the second player puts a guard down, the third player puts a guard down, and the fourth player puts a guard down. They can put them anywhere on the wall, okay? And just so you know how it's set up on the wall, if you have, you see how it's one through five, one through five, one through five, one through five, these are wall sections, okay? I'm going to explain much more about this later, but these wall sections are where the guards can defend against the wildlings. Um, so if a wildling, for instance, is in this section of the wall, they can only breach this section of the wall. They can't like jump over here and breach that section. So when you're placing your guards, you can, most of the time when people set it up, they put it only on the parts of the, of the wall that's not guarded. So usually you have a guard on each wall by the set of the game. But yes, you can certainly place a guard with another guard. You'll just put it on the two spot. There's already somebody in the one spot there. I'll explain more of the guards later when I talk about the wildlings attacking the city. Another thing that stays the same is when you are taking your resources to begin the game, you take it from the second settlement you placed. So if this is the first one I placed during the setup phase, and this is the second, I'm going to begin with a wood, a wood, and a sheep. Two woods and one sheep. The final part about the setup phase is to give everybody their appropriate hero. Yes, you start with hero, but it starts with a specific one. And the rulebook says when a four-player game, you find the A4, 3, 2, and 1 heroes and appropriately distribute them to player one, two, three, and four in that order. And they all have a special ability. In a three-player game, good old Orthel Yarwick goes away and you just go with three, two, and one. So if you need to remember four for a four-player game, three for a three-player game. I will explain more about how to use a hero later on, but this is your special ability that you have until you use it and exchange it. All right, that's it for the setup. You're race, basically ready to go, set the game up, let's move on to the next phase, which is basically how you end the game. How do you win? I'm just going to go straight to the rulebook for this one. If you want to know how the game ends, let's just go to the back of the rulebook on page 8. If you have 10 victory points on your turn, you win the game. So if you get 10 victory points, game over. The thing is, though, is that two bad things can happen. Number one, which is rule number two here, is that you might have seven wildlings on different hexes on the board. If that ever happens, unfortunately, the game, well, if there's more than seven, I'm sorry, if, there, if it goes eight or more, the game ends. I've never had this happen. I played this game a few times. That's never happened. The one that has happened the most often, though, if it's ever a tragic victory, is where the wall gets breached three times. Basically, if the wildlings overcome the guards. I'm going to explain the breach in a moment in the wildness section of the video, but if ever that happens three times, game over, and the person with the most guards on the on the uh, wall win the game. If you have questions about tiebreakers, just look right here. I don't need to go into it. I've never seen a tiebreaker yet, so that's good.
Okay, let's talk about using your hero, all right? Generally speaking, after you roll the dice, you can use your hero on your turn, and then either flip it over to use it again on a subsequent turn, or turn it into the bank and select a new hero from the ones that are not being used currently. So it's really nice. You can use a hero once, return it, get a new hero, like Egret, for example. Use Egret, throw it back in the pile, and search for good old Bowen again and get him back. As long as you just make sure that you exchange it or turn it over after you've used it, you'll be in good shape. So let's go into a little bit further though. Let's use Bowen Marsh as, as an example. If I have Bowen Marsh on my turn, you see it says, you exchange a single resource card with the supply at a one-to-one -one rate. So on my turn, if I'm using Bowen Marsh, I simply say, okay, this turn, I'm gonna use wood as my trade option resource and then that entire turn I can trade wood at a one-to-one -one rate with the bank. I can give a wood for a wheat, a wood for a brick, etc. Now once my turn's over, I turn this card over if I want to use them again on my next turn or whenever I want to use them again during, during the game. Or if you look at the bottom, it says after use, flip it over or exchange it. So I just kind of toss it over here, go to the the pile and select the other one I wanted to use and put that in my in front of me for my next time to use it. That's generally how almost every single hero will be used. You use it once, flip it over, and then you're done. You cannot use it twice on the same turn. But of course, the entire turn, like for Bowen Marsh, for instance, obviously for that entire turn, I'm able to use that wood as my one-to-one -one rate the entire time, but I can't flip it over and say, okay, now I'm going to use brick on the same turn. That can't happen. Some heroes, though, if you look, it says before or after your own production roll, you may do the following. So sometimes you can use a hero before you even roll, but I promise you it's going to be so easy to understand by just reading the dang thing. Just read it, and you'll know exactly what to do. But yeah, of course, you can do something before you roll if it says you can. Samuel Tarley is a little bit unique. Good old Sam. Here's the th thing about Sam is that this guy basically gives you a resource if you don't receive any production. Like if you're um, if you're not on an 8 and an 8 gets rolled, you get to pick up a card. This is nice because you can use it on any production roll. So just, just know that Sam Tarly is nice to use. And this is like the only hero that I've seen that you can use outside of your own turn. Just make sure after you use it, it says it down here at the bottom. It says, take your resource card before any other hero is used. Basically right after production, if you want to use Sam, use it. If you forget to use them and somebody else uses a hero, unfortunately, you know, if your teammates are sticklers, you can't use them during that turn if you forget to use it. So if I was using Sam on somebody else's turn for whatever reason I used it, I would turn him over to use him again during the same round. You know, like if somebody else before it got back to me does it, I can still use him. Or again, I can just exchange it for another card. Just be aware of some of them. For instance, Mance Raider. This is somebody that you can only use if uh, against somebody that has more victory points than you. So if you notice that it has something like that, you do have to use the hero before you can exchange it. So don't get stuck with Mance Raider if you're the leader. Because otherwise you're going to have Mance sitting there in front of you for the entire time before you can exchange it. You cannot exchange a hero unless you have used that hero. So just be aware of that. Okay, hopefully you're staying with me. That's the end of the hero section. Now let's move into how you work with the guards. How do the guards work? How do you set them up? And, and what do they do? All right, I'm going to explain much more about how guards work when I get to the wildlings and how they move and they attack, etc. But I want to go over this right now because you're probably curious. Whenever you build a guard, you always place it on the furthest left portion available on any wall you choose. So if I'm going to build a guard and I want to block this portion of the wall that's going to be blocking wildlings coming down this way on the board, I would put it on the number one spot. If I come over to this wall and I want to add more protection to this wall, I put it in the number two spot. In this one, four. And in this one, three. If, for whatever reason, a guard gets taken, the first one that gets taken is always the one on the furthest to the left or the lowest number. So, for instance, if a wildling comes down here and one of these guards have to go, it's always going to be the furthest left one first. And then guess what? These guys shift down a spot. So three now becomes open for another person to put one there. And if you're looking at this, remember, black in this instance has one victory point temporarily associated with his point count because he has three guards out there. If he had five, he would have two victory points. And as you know, if, an, if a wildling comes in here and removes this guard, that victory point would go away, as I explained before. So that's basically how the guards work. You place them on the high, lowest number available on the wall you choose, and then you remove the lowest one on the wall if ever they need to be removed. Okay, now I'm at the portion of the video that you've all been waiting for. The wildlings. Who the heck 
do these people think they are to attack the gift? Let me start by explaining this very simply, uh, bit by bit. The first thing you have is the, uh, I think it's called the Frostlings. This is the area of the map that the Wildlings originate from. Nothing happens over here. This is just where you store them. It's plenty of space to store them. Now, the Wildlings, when they approach the gift, which is the board over here, they have to come through the clan area. And this is the clan area up here at the top, okay? Now, the clan area has three clans. You have the Ice River Clan. No, that is not a ladder. That is a sled of some sort. That's an Ice River Clan. The Cave People Clan and the Hornfoot Clan. Those are the three clans in this clan area. Now, each clan area has a camp. And you can see the camps. You have the hot campfire here. And the campfire goes from hottest to least hot. Hottest to least hot. Hottest to least hot. All right. Now, when the wildlings come in, they enter, just so you know. Like, if you get a, a wildling that needs to enter from the Ice River Clan, they're going to enter at the hottest fire. So whenever you bring one in, it almost always starts at whatever fire is hottest. It's, it's kind of like they're going backwards almost. You'll see what I mean in a moment. Now, when a wildling advances from the camp area where the clans are towards the wall, they enter into what we call the clearings. Anything beneath these bronze number are called the clearing. This is the area where you consider whether or not they attack the wall and jump over, uh, if they, a guard gets removed, etc. This is where the clearing is and where all that happens. If a wildling is not in a clearing yet, they're not technically a threat, but once they get the clearing into the clearing, they are an immediate threat and you gotta take action with them somehow. Now, if you look at the clearing, you'll notice that there's certain numbers on them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven slash eight. So if you notice this little bronze outline that is indicating where the where there's a, a clearing, a one or a two from the gray dice basically moves the wildlings from this clan into this clearing. A three moves them from this clan area into this clearing, a four from this, etc. And you'll notice that there's two numbers at least at most, actually, from any uh, clan area into a clearing. A 1 and a 2, a 3 and a 4, a 5 and a 6, a 7 and an 8. Uh, that's why you see a 1 slash 2 here, because every single clan area needs to lead into a clearing by with at least two numbers. And so that's why you have them listed there. And this dice represents these numbers down here, which I'll explain later. So hopefully, at least from this point in the video, you understand clan area with three different clans... The wildlings are going to come into the camps on these clans and then eventually make their way into these clearings and breach the wall. I want you to understand that terminology so that you can understand everything else in the subsequent parts of this video. Now, there are only four ways that a wildling will move from the frostlings into this clan area at all. There's only four ways, okay? The first two ways are obvious. Whenever somebody claims the longest road or whenever somebody claims the largest patrol. I'm talking about any time, when somebody gets it for the first time, when it rotates to somebody else, etc. Anytime somebody claims a new, this card, they automatically need to migrate a wildling. And I'll explain that in a moment. A keep will migrate two wildlings. Anytime somebody builds a keep, two wildlings must enter the board into that clan area. Anytime somebody builds a settlement, a wildling must enter the board into that clan area. And if you look at your building card, it kind of helps you remember. Whenever you build a settlement, you got to get one wildling out there. I'll explain these these chips in a moment. But the keep, always, you got to bring two wildlings in there. And I'll explain that now. These tokens that I put on the Catan box represent the migration tokens. Okay, so obviously they're all turned face down with a fire. I'm telling you that whenever you migrate a wildling, you got to put it on a fire. That's all it's reminding you to do. When you pick it up, you basically turn it over, and it tells you on the back exactly how to migrate the wildlings. So this is telling me that the next wildling is going to be an Ice River Clan, and it's going to be a climber, indicated by the climbing sticks in the bottom right-hand corner. I flipped over a few more to show you exactly kind of what it might look like. You have the Hornfoot Clan, you got to bring in a regular wildling. You have the Cave People Clan, you got to bring in a giant. Hornfoot, you got to bring in a climber, etc. Whenever you flip it over, just do it as it says. Go to the, that clan and plop in that wildling. So let's say I drew this. I would just simply pick up a climber and I go over to the Hornfoot Clan, find the hottest fire available, and boom. Let's say on another turn, I build another settlement, I pick up this one. It says Cave People Clan, regular wildling. I find the regular wildling, which looks like this guy, 
running around with a little axe, kind of like Tormund does. Sorry if it doesn't focus. I'm going to find that cave people clan, go to the hottest fire, pop them in there. And then boom, let's say I get this one. It's a cave people clan climber. Let's say I get this one. Well, in that case, I will pick up a climber, which you can see here. Find the cave people clan, find the hottest fire available, and boom, I put them right there. That's all it is. Just find the hottest fire available when you migrate a clan and plop them on there. All I want you to understand at this point is not is what clan area means, what cl those those camps mean, and what that clearing means, as you as I explained earlier, and that you need to bring in a wildling whenever you get the victory point for the largest patrol, longest road, or a keep or settlement. Those are the only four times you got to migrate them by turning over these chips and just simply placing the wildling on the hottest fire. Okay, I know I haven't explained what the different wildlings do yet. That's not important yet. I need to make sure you understand this whole migration part first. The next thing I want to talk about is what they call a mig a wildling rush. Okay, let's say that we have this ice the uh, ice people clan over here, the ice river clan, and they are full. You can notice that there's no more fire to put somebody on. That is a blank spot that you cannot put anybody on. That little empty spot. I know it's confusing, but you can't put anybody there. Whenever you have four people in a clan area and let's say we draw another token this one says i need to bring a climber in there well there's no place to place my climber i cannot put him here that is not a legal move so what you do in that case is you have to place him in somehow what happens is the wildlings rush the wall what this means is that you simply take the first wildling move him forward from the lowest number so i moved him on the one and two side of this clearing and put him into the one and two clearing then i take this wildling and put him into this clearing and then i move everybody else up to. So now we have three remaining in the clan area and these two have now rushed the wall in the clearing. I'm not going to explain what happens when they attack the wall yet. I just want to make sure you understand that whenever this happens where you have four in an area and you need to bring m one more in, you have to rush them by moving the first one forward by the lowest number and the second one forward and the, and on the remaining clearing, which is the higher number, and then bring everybody else forward too. And that will be, well, that is how you migrate a full clan area for a wildling. Okay, now let me explain the normal way that wildlings would advance towards the wall, okay? And I purposely don't have guards up here because I just want to explain the concept. When everybody rolls, they're going to be rolling with three dice. They have all three dice in their hand, and they're rolling on, on the board, obviously. So you get your production roll. Ooh, in this case, I rolled a seven. I don't usually like those rolls. But you also have your your wilding dice, this gray dice. And in this case, it said it was a four. Okay, But in this case, um, the numbers I'm worried about for this clan, the Ice River clan, are the one, the two, and the three. If any number on this, if this dice rolls any of those numbers, I know that I have to advance this clan towards that number on the wall, okay? So if I rolled a one, for instance, that means I have to take this guy and move him on the one slash two section of this clearing. So this guy immediately goes in here and does whatever action he does with the guards at the wall um, at that moment, which I'm gonna explain later, okay? Once that happens, all these fires that are now open need to be filled. So the hottest fire gets filled, all these are down, and now the next wild need to get migrated whenever that happens, on the Ice River Clan, it would go in the back. Okay, so let's say on the next turn I rolled a three, for instance, then this this guy would move forward into the three clearing and do whatever action he needs to do, depending on the guard situation, etc. And these guys would move up. Okay, so I'm going to explain how what happens when these guys meet guards and when these guys meet the walls, etc. I just want to make sure that now you understand how these things are moving, how they advance, how they migrate. Hopefully by this point, you understand that. If there's any questions about that, please leave that in the comments. Okay, now let's explain how each of these wildlings would interact at the wall when they're in a clearing. This is probably what you need to help understanding the most. If you, if you struggle with migration, hopefully you understand that by now. Now, the second thing you're probably <laughs> struggling to understand is, okay, well, what the heck happens when they get into this clearing? Immediately, when any wildling gets into a clearing, you have to make sure you resolve the effects of that. Sometimes the effects of that would be absolutely nothing. Sometimes they would be something very significant. So let's go through it one by one. Let's start with the good old regular wildling, okay? These guys are your basic wildling, and, and, and uh, it's actually, these ones are the most simple. Whenever a regular wildling is in a clearing, they stay in that clearing and don't do anything until there is an insufficient amount of guards to the number of regular wildlings in the clearing. So obviously right now you have one wildling, one regular wildling to two guards. It's protected. This guy's not going to do jack squat, so he's totally fine. 
even if I rolled a three on the gray dice and brought another regular wildling into here, we're still safe, right? Not a problem at all. However, if a third one, for some reason, moves in there, guess what happens, okay? So when you have three in there, immediately the oldest guard on the wall, the one in the one spot, gets removed. So you still have one guard remaining, that's fine. But a breach happens. You remove a guard, and immediately these guys breach the wall. All three of them do. All the ones that are there breach the wall. And they basically, if you look at the arrow on this side, you see how there's an arrow pointing down? It's saying that they're going to overcome this row of hexes in order. So I'm going to go to the first hex, then the second hex, and then the third hex. Notice that even if Tormund's on there, they kind of share that hex together, okay? So Tormund can move around as, as they go, but you, you overcome those hexes. And uh, they are now blocked, just like a, a robber would block them. They are blocked, and it would have to be removed before you could actually receive production from those hexes. So just to show you again, we have three regular wildlings, so two guards. This guard gets removed. Okay, so that guard's gone. We have one guard remaining. But all three of these now invade the gift, and those three resources are now blocked. You cannot receive production from them until they're removed. Now, when a breach like that happens, it is not good because the breach marker over here will go down. That's one breach. You only get three breaches per game before you have a tragic victory ending option. So you don't want that to happen, and all the players that are associated on these hexes are probably going to be really upset, and they're going to have to figure out ways to use heroes and the patrol to get rid of those wildlings. All right, now let's talk about the climber. What happens when a climber gets into the clearing? What happens? Okay, so let's say we have... Two uh, regular wildlings against two guards, okay? We're really nervous, right? We're on the brink of being rushed, okay? Well, let's say a three gets rolled, a three on the great ice gets rolled, and this climber moves into this clearing. Well, immediately you're going to think, oh, no, it's a breach. We're so in trouble. No, you're fine. A climber, whenever it jumps into a clearing, nothing really happens at all to the guards or anybody in here. Just know that if ever a climber makes into a clearing, it just automatically jumps a wall. So in this case, the climber just jumps the wall and goes to six. So if I rolled a gray three and that climber enters into this clearing, you immediately just pick it up, jump it over the wall, and boom, it gets on that six. Um, and you're going to have to remove that with a hero or, or a patrol. Okay, so just be aware of that. Climbers don't do anything in relation to the breaching of a wall. This will never, ever move because of a climber. Now, the way people prevent climbers from getting onto the board is they usually remove them with a hero. There's a hero that lets you remove them in the northern area of the map. I think it's Benjen Stark that you can remove this guy from the from the from the north and just kind of replace him over here and, and draw a new wildling migration token to hopefully prevent climbers from easily getting onto the board. But that's all climbers do. Once they get into a clearing, they immediately just jump the wall. Nothing else really happens. It's just annoying. Now let's talk about the giant, though. The giant's interesting. So when the giant is called, when, when let's so again we're working with this three here. Okay, so let's say we roll a gray three and the giant enters the clearing. And this is a problem, especially when you have this situation. Because right now you're looking at this. I have two regular wildlings to two guards. I'm protected. Now the problem is when the giant gets in there. What a giant does is it a giant automatically removes a guard on the wall. It's a one for one trade. So I basically, if a giant gets in there in this scenario, I take the giant out and I take the oldest guard out, and look what's happened. I have one guard remaining to two regular wildlings, which triggers, you guessed it, a breach, a wall breach. These guys breach the wall and enter into the keep. And yes, because this is a breach. I do have to remove this guard now as well, because they removed that guard. So giants can be a really, really big frustration, especially because they just automatically remove a guard from the wall. That's another one you want to make sure you remove from the north before they get to the clearing. Another situation you can have with the giant is in this scenario. Let's say you roll a 1 or a 2 on the gray, and the giant enters into here. Well, notice there's not a guard on this wall. So guess what? It's an automatic breach that he just jumps right on over and blocks that five, which is also a big problem because that's just an annoyance. I mean, this guy gets this block to five, and now this has to go up again because he got a breach because it didn't even face a guard. So just a quick strategy, strategy tip. If you're ever in this situation where you have a giant about to enter into a clearing that has two regular wildlings in there already, just make sure you have extra guards there ready for that that giant to take one of them away to prevent a breach from happening. So as you can see here, the giant comes into here, 
uh, automatically removes this guard, but you still have two guards there protecting the wall, and a breach doesn't happen. It's just a strategy thing, and that's where the co-op part of the game comes into play that I enjoy. You know, usually you have people that are trying to work together to prevent that from happening. Um, but I have to admit, there are going to be a lot of times that you're going to be like, ah, no, I don't care if it breaches because uh, I want that guy to have all this stuff blocked. That'd be awesome for me. So that that will obviously happen as well, which makes it fun. Now, this situation has never happened to me, but I want to make sure you know what to do if this does happen. It's just a rarity. But let's say you have five guards in a wall with five regular wildlings, okay? What happens if you a sixth wildling enters into the area? Like, what, what are you supposed to do? Obviously, is that a breach? It looks like it because it's six going in six wildlings against five guards. Well, the game actually protects you against this because you can only have five guards on a wall. So if ever you have a five guard protected wall and you're bringing in a sixth regular wildling, okay, you basically bring in the sixth regular wildling. Yes, you do remove a guard. Okay, you remove the oldest guard. So I'd shift all these down. But the game also tells you to just make sure you take out the two wildlings to make sure it's still four to four. Okay, so it goes down, it goes from a six to five to four to four. That's what the rules tell you to do. And the reason it tells you to do that, in my opinion, is because, listen, you have five guards on the wall. You can't do anything more than that. The game rewards you for keeping that wall protected by removing two wildlings from the game for a one guard, which is awesome. Here's another sticky situation you might run into. Let's say that you have a, uh, a two wildlings that are breaching this one guard here. Okay, that stinks, first of all. Any breach stinks. But what do you do in this situation? Because you have already these three hexes guarded. So yeah, I'm going to breach the wall. It goes to the first available hex, which is going to be way down here at the bottom. But I still have one more wilding I need to put on there. Because this guard's gone. He's gone. It's, it's breaching, right? Where do I put him? It doesn't fit anywhere on here. Well, you just literally overpile him on the most nearest hex. So this guy has two wildlings on it you got to get rid of before it's clear so yes they will pile up over and over and over again until you get rid of them that's never happened to me i've never had that situation happen but it could but just i want you to make sure you're aware that you can overpile wildlings on top of each other if that scenario ever occurs and hopefully it goes without saying but i might as well say it anyway if you are ever breaching a wall and let's say that obviously you know let's say somebody removed the wildling from one of the hexes in the row obviously i'm not going to just start from the uh, the top down. I'm going to go to the most easiest to access hex in there that's available, which would be this four here. Sometimes people say, oh, if a wilding already reached down here, i got to start up here again. No, you always start with the first available hex in that row. If there's no available hexes to put a wilding on, then you start back at the top and it start to overfill. That's how it works. Folks, that's the game. That's all it is. Hopefully that wilding section helped you understand it. If you have any questions, put them in the comments, but I think that's all the rules you need to know to get started and enjoy this game. Uh, there is an expansion to this game that I will explain in a subsequent video, and yes, you can play this game with the base Catan rules. I might make a video about that, who knows, but it's. I want to make sure you understood this. It's a very fun game. Have fun. Questions in the comments, alright? Thanks.